Hallelujah. If your Bible turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and um, last week I started on a message, and we've been talking about Jesus for the last couple weeks. And um, I started, a, I start, dealt with a message last week concerning Jesus, talking about peace. And here I thought it was going to be like one week, and I'm not going to finish today either, so we'll pick up next week. Thank you, Lord. Try to do a quick review here, establish some things in our hearts. First Corinthians chapter one, uh, chapter one, verse 22. It says, for the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. I mean, you can try to seek after all the wisdom you want. You can try to seek after all the spectacular signs and wonders. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is what? The power of God and the wisdom of God. The, what, what settles every answer is Jesus. What settles, settles every answer to any problem is Jesus. Christ is the wisdom of God and Christ is the power of God. And we learned out of Isaiah, we learned the fact that wisdom, wisdom is the stability of our times and the strength of salvation. So if Christ is the wisdom of our time, is the, is the stability of our time, and Christ is the, the strength for salvation, those, so if wisdom is the stability of our time, then we have to understand Christ is going to be the stability of our time. What's going to cause unstable people to be stable in a time in which we're living in is going to be Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because he is the wisdom of God and he is the power of God. Every, every answer stops at that point. Well, what about this or what about that? And no, the, He's the wisdom of God and he's the power of God. He said, we preach Christ and him crucified. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For the sake of time, let's look at verse 3. It says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. So the God of this world, who we know who he is, Satan, he has, the age of this world has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious, the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. For do we, not, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. I don't care about your opinion. I don't care about your, even your understanding of what you think religion is. We don't preach ourselves, but what we preach Christ Jesus. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord. He's not just, he's not just a good man. He's Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your, burnt bond, your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the God of this world wants to blind people's minds so they can't see the glorious gospel. And if he blinds the world to the glorious gospel, they'll never receive the answer. They'll never receive the one that's wisdom and power. They'll never receive the one that's really going to give them stability in their lives, in their hearts. He doesn't want us to see the light of the glorious gospel. Amen. And why we see the things in society is because people are blind to truth. I don't, I'm not judging, please hear me, I'm not judging them. I'm not judging people that may not see things the way I see things. I'm not judging someone that's choosing other, other things. What, what the thing is, is, is the Bible tells us mercy over judgment. But mercy is not about acceptance. Mercy is about intercession to the point where their eyes are open to where they can see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about peace. We learned last week that Jesus was the Prince of Peace, meaning not only is he the author of it, but he's the distributor of it. We learned in Ephesians chapter 2, it says he himself is our peace. 
2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now the Lord of peace himself gives you peace. So peace is who he is, but peace is also what he does. Peace is who he is, but also what he gives. We learned in John 14 when he says, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. And the moment that Jesus made that statement, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. All of a sudden, when Jesus made that statement, it became a covenant. When you see Jesus declaring things in Scripture, when he speaks it, it becomes a covenant. And we learn, we learn from Numbers chapter 6, we learn from Ezekiel 37, we learn from Isaiah chapter 57, we learned how we have been given a covenant of peace. And Isaiah tells us that would never be removed. A covenant of peace. A covenant of peace. Say, I have a covenant of peace. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and let's get into something new. As we continue to talk about peace. Matthew chapter 6. So he himself is our peace. We have a covenant of peace. So what is this peace? Thank you, Father. Matthew chapter 6. Look in verse 9. It says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the famous prayer of Jesus. He's teaching his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's known in the Old Testament as Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Meaning, meaning everything that you are, God, everything that your kingdom rests upon, let that come, let that come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is in heaven, let it be done here on the earth. That's the declaration. You see, there's no confusion in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no deception in heaven. There's no anger in heaven. There's no guilt in heaven. There's no shame in heaven. There's no hate in heaven. There's no confusion. There's no strife. Let what's in heaven, let it be done here on the earth. That's, that's the prayer, that's the, that's the declaration of Jesus, that, that, that the heavenly Father, that what would be in heaven would be established on the earth, and what would be established on the earth would be the kingdom. John the Baptist tells us, we're told of John the Baptist in Matthew 3, it tells us that he said, hey, there's a new kingdom coming, repent for the kingdom, kingdom of heaven is at hand. That wasn't about necessarily asking forgiveness. It was talking about coming to a place where there's a new system coming. There's a new way of doing coming. There's a new way of living coming. Hey, you've been going this direction in this, this sin nature, in this nature of pursuing self and pursuing all these things. John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? It doesn't mean to confess your sin. It means to turn around, hey, and go to another direction. So John the Baptist was saying, hey, there's a new kingdom coming. There's a new, that means there's a new way of living coming. There's a new way of acting coming. There's a new way of thinking coming. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Hallelujah. I'm progressing. I'm advancing. I'm experiencing promotion. I will see my highest expectation fulfilled because that's what my 2024 is looking like. And what it, what it looks like. Amen? Yeah. Luke chapter 12. His, talking about his kingdom. Let's look at verse 29. It says, And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor be anxious of mine. If you have anxiousness of mind, then you don't have peace, right? 
What does Paul tell us in Philippians? He talks about that don't be anxious for anything but in everything, right? In prayer and supplication, right? That's a whole other message. But here we know the, an- the answer to anxiousness, according to what Paul said in, in Philippians 4, 7 through 9, the answer would be, and let the peace of God... What? Guard your heart, right? So, so the peace is what's going to be the thing that's going to hard my, guard my heart while I'm going through difficult times. So, so here he says, not, don't be ang- don't, nor be anxious of mine, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God. But seek the kingdom of God. I want what's in the kingdom. How about you? Seek the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. Matthew tells us seek first. Here it says seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Then it says this. Do not fear little flock for it is your father's good pleasure. Good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Man, Vic. It's the Father's good pleasure to give. God is not holding anything out on you. There's not anything that has been withheld from heaven. If there was something that would have been withheld from heaven for you and me, it would have been Jesus. What does Romans 8 tell us? It says, if he gave his only son, how much more would he give us all things? How much more, yeah, how much more would he give us all things? So there's nothing that the kingdom of heaven is holding out on the, on the believer. It's your father's good pleasure. The father takes great pleasure when we're operating and receiving from the kingdom. It's the father's good pleasure, wow, to give you the kingdom. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Go to Romans chapter 14. Just laying a foundation here. Thank you that your peace fills this place today. Yes, Lord. Before we read this, let's, let's think about the word peace for a moment. Let me make this statement. Peace is not an emotion. Peace is not. And you say, well, how are you doing today? I'm at peace. No, peace is not an emotion. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. So if it's a fruit of the Spirit, it doesn't come from my surroundings. But it comes from the kingdom. Love, joy, peace. Peace is a force that causes me to live on another level than this world lives on. Peace is not calm or the absence of trouble. Hear this. Peace is the power that produces the calm. When Jesus said, peace be still to the storm, and it said, and there was a great calm. Peace isn't the calm. Peace is the power that produces a calm. I I want you to see this because a lot of times we think, you know, it's like, well, I just need peace. And really what you're saying is I just need this difficulty to stop. But there's a way and I've lived in this, I've lived in this, and a lot of you as well, because I know it's a lot of your stories, where you can have peace in the midst of your storm and not be moved by it. Amen. Why? Because peace is not the absence of, of uh, trouble. Peace is the, get a hip. Peace is the force, one of the forces that undergirds my, my position of faith. Romans 15, 13, what does it say? The God of hope fills you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the God of hope, 
And then the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy, what? In believing. So it's in my faith that as I'm operating and living this life of faith, my peace and my joy are coming to another level. If you have no peace, you probably haven't stepped into a position of true faith yet. So let's look at this. Romans chapter 4. We talked about the kingdom. We talked about his kingdom on earth as is in heaven. We talked about it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In this chapter, he talks about, in this chapter, he talks about eating and drinking and so forth, which, you know, Jesus talked about that in Luke 12, not be anxious about food or those things. But verse 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Passion Translation says this, the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but is in the realm of the Holy Spirit filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. So when you say, let the kingdom of God be done on earth as it is in heaven, and here it totally defines on what the kingdom of God is and tells us the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. But it tells us what it is that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. So the kingdom of God has the ability to make wrong things right. The kingdom of God has the ability to right wrongs. The kingdom of God has the ability to bring peace into a kingdom where there is no peace. The kingdom of God has the ability to bring joy in the midst of adversity. Because that's what the kingdom of God does. So what does heaven look like? Righteousness, peace, and joy. And whatever those words might look like to you, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Say, thank God for the word. Look at verse 43. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. So we could say this, I must preach righteousness, peace, and joy to the other cities also because for this purpose I have been sent. Do you know why Jesus came? He said, I came to preach the kingdom. He didn't come to preach the acceptance of anyone's sin. He came to preach the answer to the sin. He came to preach repentance and he preached the kingdom of God. This is why I came. This, this is why I, I must preach. This is something I have to do. This is why I'm here. I've got to preach the message of the kingdom. Passion Translation says this, paraphrase says this, don't you know there are other places I must go and offer the hope of God's kingdom? This is what I'm sent to do. So he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also because that's why I'm sent. But he didn't go around just saying, kingdom, Terry, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. That, that's not what he preached. So let's look at what he did preach. So let's look at same chapter. Let's go back to verse 17. So this is all in, in, in connection with each other on the kingdom of God in what Jesus preached. Okay? Verse 17. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
I must preach the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. But yet what he preached was this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. If you are poor, is there really a whole lot of peace in that? I've been poor. I ha hey, I... <laughs> There's no peace in poverty. If you're brokenhearted, you don't have peace. If there's blindness or there's an ailment, there's no peace. There's no peace. If you're in bondage, you don't have peace. If you're bruised, you don't have peace. So everything that Jesus declared was the answer to the issue, and the answer was, hey, I'm going to preach the gospel to the poor. What the gospel is the good news that says you don't need to be in poverty any longer. He came to heal the brokenhearted, meaning, meaning, meaning Jesus said, I want to do something about the lack of peace you have in your life. You're in bondage. You're in bondage to addiction. You're in bondage to something. There's no peace in that. And Jesus said, I came to bring and proclaim liberty to the captives. So the anointing. So, so Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor. He came to preach the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy, meaning everything he did everywhere he went was to go around and bring peace where there was no peace. Yes, Glory to God. Go to Matthew chapter 4. kingdom. Everything in the kingdom is to bring us into a place of peace. Because we have a covenant of peace. Why, am, why do I believe in prosperity? Because I believe in the covenant of peace. Why do I believe in healing? Because I believe in the covenant of peace. Why do I b believe that he is still a burden removing, yoke destroying God? Because I believe in a covenant of peace. Matthew chapter 4, look at verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the what? Kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. And healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick, all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments he came to do something about your torment various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed epileptics paralytics and he healed them and great multitudes followed him from Galilee uh, from Galilee from Decapolis Jerusalem Judea and beyond the Jordan meaning everyone wanted in on this peace Everyone wanted in on the righteous. Everyone wanted in on the joy. Everyone wanted on this, the kingdom, right? Do you want in on the kingdom? How about, I, I don't know about you, but I want in on the kingdom. Yes. Hallelujah. That was the message. The message of the kingdom was about what Jesus came to do for each one of us, spirit, soul, and body. Is it, is it Luke chapter 10 where, where Jesus, Jesus was talking and he said, he goes, Kevin, he goes, if I cast out a devil with the finger of God, he goes, know this, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. So everywhere we see the kingdom in operation, we see people's lives healed, delivered, set free, 
clothed in the right mind. Amen? Because that's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is more than you're going to go to heaven one day. The gospel of the kingdom is that you can live life on a whole nother level. I believe the word. I, I believe the word of God. Amen. So now when you see it, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in, the, in heaven. Mm-hmm. Come on. Now you can put some, wait a minute, that's what that means. Yes, sir. Instead of just treating it as some sort of religious prayer that you might recite. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. I'm, I'm almost finished here because I believe God wants to show out in some things today. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for you to move. Mm. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 10, let's look at verse 36. Actually, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Hallelujah. He shows no partiality, but in every nation. Whoever fears him, you can also equate fears him with expects him. But in every nation, whoever fears him, or you could say who puts him first, whoever's relying on him. So you can't separate the fear of God from having faith in God. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching what? So what was the mess? The word? which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. What was the word that was to be preached? It was peace. Peace is not an emotion. Peace is the power that changes things. Peace is a power that steadies you. Peace is a power that keeps you from opening your mouth when you want to open your mouth. Peace. <laughs> because it's a, it's a force. And if you if you if we take if we if I had time this morning, I'm, that's not what I'm supposed to go, but if we had the time and went through Galatians chapter five and talked the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, you have to understand that everything I do in my flesh is is going to produce the lack of peace in my life. If you're committing adultery right now, there's no way you have peace about it. If you're lying, there's no way you have peace about it. The word, verse 3, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Verse 37, that word you know. And what was the word? Peace. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, began in Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. What happened after the baptism that John preached? That was in Matthew chapter 3. What happened after it? What's after 3? 4. I mean, sorry, Luke 3. Luke 3. What's after Luke 3? Luke 4. And what did Jesus preach? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. So this was the message of Jesus. And it was a message of peace that the word which you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. What was the message also? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. How God anointed Jesus 
of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed, oppressed, oppressed by the devil. Go look up that word oppressed. Everything that you can think of, anywhere from emotional all the way to disease, is capsulated in that word oppressed. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and what? Healing. Every miracle that we see Jesus doing He was bringing peace to a situation. You know, that woman with the issue of blood had spent all that she had, still not any better. Jesus turned around and said, your faith had made you whole. And he he said, virtue went out of me. Virtue went out of me. We could call that virtue power. We could call that virtue anointing. But we could also, according to what we talked about today, we can call that virtue peace. She laid hold of the kingdom. Whether he multiplied fish in loaves, whether he rose Lazarus from the dead, whatever it is he was doing, he was doing something about the oppression of the devil. And he said, and it says, and God was with him. That means love was with him, peace was with him, the kingdom was with him, everything he needed was with him. Oh, I can't wait for next week, man. You got your time for just two more scriptures. First Thessalonians chapter five. Worship team, you can come up. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Lord. First Thessalonians five. Thank you, Father. Verse twenty three, I believe it is. Now may the God of what? Peace. Himself. (laughs) The God of peace himself. So peace is not a something, it's a someone. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. The word sanctify is set apart. Without taking too long with it, if you look at, look at, look at, uh, uh, you look at Titus, Chapter 3 or chapter 2, it it tells us how we're sanctified. It says we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. If you look at John chapter 14, when he says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. But right before that, he talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and so what does the God of peace himself do? What, he does it completely, and he says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. So there's something that the peace of God himself can do. It sets you apart and it makes you whole. It didn't say make you holy. It says make you complete spirit, soul, and body. Yes, sir. So the peace of God himself has the ability to affect every aspect of my life. Let's close with this, Romans chapter 16. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Hallelujah. Romans 16. Hallelujah. I think think I'm about to shout. Anyone, you know, anyone going through some challenges right now? Anyone have any sickness in their body right now? Anyone that, you know, that, that things, that things that you're just weighed down by, by negative situations?
Mm. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. <laughs> so we, we, we classified everything that's a work of the devil, right? I mean, I could go into a long, longer list, but you get, the, you get the picture, right? Jesus came and he said to destroy, you know, what is it, 1 John 4, 8, it says, and Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. He went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And here Paul writes, may, may the God of peace, the God of peace, and it says, and the God of peace will, 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 will crush will. Satan will. under your feet. Hallelujah. There's some things where the enemy thought he had the upper hand in your life, but it's the God of peace. Hallelujah. Will crush Satan under your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then it says, shortly. That's better translated, speedily. Hallelujah. Uh, it's time for some suddenlies. Hallelujah. It's time for suddenlies. Hallelujah, to take place in the church. There's time for some suddenly things to happen through your life. Hallelujah. I believe that God, hallelujah, in this day and hour is crushing Satan under our feet. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.